Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat, an enthusiast guide to the 1980s cultural phenomenon that was Miami Vice. I'm Dominic and joined with me always is my brother up in Seattle and Jenna in the San Francisco Bay Area. Before we get started, we'd like to check in and see what's going on with each other's lives. John, how are things going up in the beautiful Pacific Northwest? Oh, I'm just super busy um, with uh, our mother moving up here. I've <laughs> uh moved boxes and health projects and uh uh dog set uh for her already so um just enjoying having both my parents uh within 10 minutes of me so <laughs> that now uh I am responsible for any chores <laughs> well, hey, I guess, you know, you've lived away for a few years now. You got some catching up to do. I'm just trying to figure out where I'm moving next. <laughs> <laughs> We've all put in our time, okay? <laughs> well, as you can hear, Jenna's with us, too, in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. I live in the nerd dream. Jenna, how's nerd capital going? <laughs> it's good. I'm so tired. <laughs> L- living in the nerd capital is is exhausting. But uh but it's good. We're it's a birthday weekend for us here, so I've been trying to keep up with that and may have overdone it trying to belt some Celine last night in karaoke. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, just uh, that's that's trying dangerous. to recover. That's dangerous. I mean, yeah. you got to go with someone that can. I mean, you might you you say you say try to sing Celine Dion. You might as well try to sing like Whitney Houston or something. Like bring yeah. the octaves <laughs> down a little bit, lower the yeah. expectation. No, well we well we mm. had Whitney on the list too, and uh, <laughs> they both are neither like neither of them are, are as difficult as Adele. So. Oh, this sounds like torture. <laughs> no wonder I don't go to karaoke bars. No, it's glorious. <laughs> Well, let's get started. Let's get into this episode. This podcast is about season one, episode five, titled The Hit List, or alternately titled Calderon's Return. Um, Let's get started and break into the show. The episode starts out, you know, pretty standard. You know, it's almost like a cold open, right? They're going to come in. They were in the middle of something that's been happening throughout the week. And we just come into the, and in this case, we've started in a spot where Tubbs and Crockett are part, are on duty for, they're just um, like watching someone across in the hotel across from theirs. And they're doing it like old school, right? They're on they got, a stakeout. Yeah, there we go. That's the word that I was looking for. Yeah, so they're just watching through. They're doing it old school too, right? They got like the cassette tapes. They're recording the conversations. They're watching them through a telescope. And I don't know what kind of apartment building that is, but that's a sweet ass like little water park they got going on. And it's not on the roof. It's like in the middle of it. So they come in and Tubbs is watching yeah, through uh, the actually, that, telescope. Yeah, actually, that was where I rose. To, um, there's a hole in that building. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, at first <laughs> I thought when you look at it, there's like, it's like a hole in the building and there's a swimming pool and table around it and then there's like this red spiral staircase and at first i thought that was like see, a I was water slide that was a slide yeah exactly i thought it was a slide yeah, i was see? like man like these rich people really know how to live like they got this swimming pool in the building in the I middle know. of the building and then like a s- sweet ass slide that goes into the pool oh you guys don't have that <laughs> <laughs> but it means stairs supposed to be let down so basically what's happening is mm-hmm. is that they're watching a target that uh, and they're just finishing up their end of the shift on the stakeout. They're, and all they're hearing at the time is they're watching through and they're just hearing old white men talk to gold diggers. And yeah, uh, yeah. by the end of it, the B team with Zito and Switek coming, they come to take over. And I guess there's an attempted humor at the end of the scene. Because it's so like, awkward. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. All I know is, all I know is the Seth Rogen cop dresses, it even dresses like Seth Rogen. Like, <laughs> yeah. I wonder if this was Seth Rogen's idol growing up. Like, this is what he's framed his image around. <laughs> yeah, um, I but I think even he knew um, that the jokes were bad because he wouldn't even look up from the old timey telescope. Yeah. So, uh-huh. yeah, it was. It that was it was an awkward opener. Yeah, and they were just making jokes about seeing <clears throat> someone naked, and then like, uh, so Zito comes running out of the bathroom, zipping himself up so that he can look out, you know, in the telescope to see the naked ladies. Like, ha ha, sing mm-hmm. credits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the next scene, uh, Crockett and Tubbs roll up in Crockett's uh, Ferrari, which once again begs the question: Can he for, uh, Ford at Ferrari? Mm-hmm. And then, as he gets out and heads up the steps of the courthouse, it got it almost like turned into like a Law and Order episode. 
um, where he's meeting his wife. Yeah, uh, yeah. So let's and say her wife's lawyer. Yeah, yeah. So let's set this up. He's having he was shaving in the opening scene before the credits roll when they're doing the stakeout because he's preparing for to go to divorce court and go have his lawyer meet with Caroline's lawyer so they can start the the divorce proceedings. So remember from the episode before, they had had an argument because Caroline wanted to move to Atlanta. So this was them going to court. And you're right, like it's it's like a law and order. They have like a whole uh-huh. a whole pre trial meeting up on the steps, which I don't know how standard that is, but mm-hmm. yeah. I don't know. It's just like I feel like I've seen that scene in a dozen law and order where the lawyers are standing on the courthouse steps talking. Crockett is wearing like the sweetest white suit and like a baby blue mm-hmm. button up shirt. And like this, like a uh, yellow blue tie. I mean, he is, he looks slick going to this court hearing <laughs> you know, coming from a stakeout. Yeah, that's a good outfit. Uh-huh. Um, and so in the um, middle of the lawyers talking, there's like an argument, like we're going to do this and we're going to do that between lawyer to lawyer. And then you can just see on the face of Caroline and Crockett that they're like, like, oh, this is stupid. Let's go talk. And then S- Sonny says, hey, Caroline, let's go talk about this. And they step aside. My initial thought was at first, it almost seemed like the banter between Caroline and the lawyer, especially when she called him Alan, like, like. Is she banging her lawyer? Like, that was my (laughs) first thought. (laughs) Right. And then this is totally, they step away, and there's this totally kind of awkward scene where it's like, I don't want to get divorced anymore. It's Uh, it's just the transition that's really weird, right? Like, I feel like the... So are they they back together? Are they just uh, booty calls now? Like, well, like- the cadence of the whole episode, and of course, like we'll go into the other scenes. But I felt like that was it was just treated really strangely, where they just walk away, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, divorce is off, guys, deuces, and they just like <laughs> go bang, and then yeah. later on in the episode, everybody else just treats it as normal, like. Oh, okay. Even Gina later in the episode is is like, oh, okay, I wasn't just banging you like ten miles out in the ocean, you know, yeah. two weeks ago. But cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, you're right. They move really fast, but I think they tried to hint at in episodes earlier that neither of them really wanted to do it. That there's like some small thing that's causing this to happen. I think that's what it was trying to be hinted at at earlier episodes. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. the small thing being his incredibly stressful job that threatens their life constantly <laughs> yeah it's just a minor detail really. yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. i think she's just a complainer yeah, I, personally but <laughs> I, I think that's all over with i don't think that's gonna come up anymore i don't think his family will be in danger <laughs> <laughs> nothing <laughs> i so, think yeah. he's put that whole past behind him <laughs> This scene is, I mean, all around, it's really weird, right? So they walk up. Crockett's looking great. Caroline looks like she fits right in the 80s. And the two lawyers, like Marsha Clark and then, like, name your douchebag lawyer. You know, he's got, like, a crocodile or an alligator briefcase. And he's, like, greased up. And the lawyers are having arguments about who they'd be able to call and, like, what, what you know, I don't know. I wasn't really pay attention to, to, to their co- conversation, but it was like, then it happened just really fast. They step aside, Crockett and Caroline talk, and then like really fast, they, they hold hands and they walk out. And as they're walking out, Crockett gives them like a parting shot to the lawyer. And then to sum up this like this whole really awkward scene, when they start walking down the street, they walk in between a cop riding a horse and a hot dog stand. <laughs> That sounds like a bad joke. Uh (laughs) Or apparently any day in Florida. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Maybe that's just a normal thing there. I don't know. So we jump from there. We go straight back to the B team. Zito and Switek are still hanging out and they're watching what's happening at the, I don't know, it's like a restaurant, pool restaurant thing that's over in this ritzy apartment complex across from them. And they're still I, watching I this I think target. that's supposed to be a ritzy hotel. I think yeah. that's a ritzy hotel and they're in, and then they're watching like the restaurant in the mm. middle of the mm-hmm. hole in the building. Ah, uh, okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. And so they hear on the chatter that like their target is ready to go out, and I think, and that's kind of what they're waiting for, right? They're just waiting for him to go out to do something. That way, they can grab him. And so the scenes like flash back and forth. They go from from Switek, and they go to this other guy who ends up being an assassin. Yellow sunglasses. You know, he's dressed like a um like a chauffeur. It's Napoleon Dynamite. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <It> looks <laughs> if Napoleon Dynamite was an assassin, that's who this guy is. 
He How do you know Napoleon Dynamite's not an assassin? <laughs> He's just hiding out in Idaho. <laughs> that could very well still be written. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like we got my idea, my next idea for my fan fiction. <laughs> I will uh, uh, already uh, claim the domain. <laughs> <laughs> Napoleon Dynamite Assassin.com. <laughs> got it. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could put a question mark inside of a domain. Assassin? <laughs> uh, so so um, at this point, there's a whole lot of setup going on, but not a lot actually happening that we understand as viewers. Yeah. yeah we so don't I, know why this guy is killing these people. We don't exactly know who these people are he's killing. Um, yeah. And we don't know how Tubbs and Crockett are going to fit into all of this. You're right. You're exactly right. Like We don't know anything about the target why the police are following this target or anything. And we cut to the scene where the assassin, he's like, he tosses something on the passenger seat of the limo and it's covered in a jacket, but you know, like there's something fishy here. And the music was really weird, right? It was this heavy piano that like ra railed up real fast, almost like um, something from The Exorcist. Yeah, the music throughout mm -hmm. this whole, like all of the chase scene and everything was really obscure. Yeah, it's the same music throughout all the action scenes, right? Right when something was going to happen, it's this heavy piano. Like, ding, 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 yeah. ding, 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 mm -hmm. So we see the target do that. He tosses something in there. He's, like, looking suspicious, and he pulls up to the front to pick up the target, and he gets out of the limo, and he lets you know, the, the target and his, his, like, associate with him. He opens up the door, and the associate looks at him. Well, actually, we don't know who the target is or who the associate Just one of them looks at the assassin like he's skeptical. The assassin goes around and opens the door for the other guy. The other guy gets in the car. He closes the door. The assassin opens up the passenger side door, pulls out this massive shotgun and, like, shoots, like, mini grenades out of this shotgun into the back seat of the limo. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just obliterates the back of the car. And then yeah. this this other guy comes running up and he's like, drop the gun, drop the gun. Is, was he a cop? I think so. I don't I can't, know. Like, I, so I just don't understand for them being an undercover organization. First of all, like I, my notes through throughout this episode just rattle on again and again about how they are the worst undercover cops ever. <laughs> yeah. That's maybe the most defining thing of this entire series so far. But this guy... Just goes running up, no backup, has no idea. Like, he's obviously chasing someone who's a threat, but has, I mean, I mean he's not, like, wearing a vest or, or anything. He doesn't have anybody to help him. He just runs right out into the open. Seems like the stupidest move. They, that, that's, like, cop training 101, isn't it? Like, don't run out into the open toward a guy who has, like, a semi-automatic weapon. I mean, I don't know. I don't even know if he's a cop because they don't mention, there's not, like, any yeah. obituaries that are mentioned throughout the rest of the episode that another cop was killed because that would mean that yeah, they don't really like mention... multiple cops killed in every episode so far. Right, that that, that yeah, was another thing yeah. that I noted was just how many people from their department, like, screw attrition, they're just dying in, yeah. like, record numbers. There's no way that they can even train up new vice cops to replace these guys at the rate that they're all dying. Yeah. Maybe that's why they have to pay uh, Crockett so much money, you know, it's because he's, <laughs> he's the only one that just alive. won't die. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I guess. You get the rest of the uh, the bonuses this year. Buy another Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this guy comes running up. He's like, "Chop the gun, chop the gun." The assassin kind of plays along, and then he whips a handgun out from his belt and he shoots that guy. Maybe he doesn't die. Uh, Maybe. And then as he starts to walk <laughs> briskly away, and he takes his gloves off. He's wearing gloves think, while he's holding the guns, and he just tosses them on the ground. I, I I think the guy that he shoots, I think he's with the people in the limo. Mm. I think that's where the confusion is. Oh. I think he's like he's like muscle for the guy who got in the limo. That would make more sense. Okay, yeah. Now that makes a lot more sense. Yeah. So yeah, he gets shot. The assassin. I mean, I'm gonna call him assassin because we know later, like he's you know he's out killing a whole bunch of people. That's the name of the episode. Yeah. The hit list. But mm. he starts walking <laughs> briskly towards the other car. The guy driving. We learn later his name is Mendez. He gets in the car while he's walking over. He takes off his gloves. He's wearing plastic gloves. He or rubber gloves. He throws them on the ground at the crime scene and then uh, gets in the car in the driveway. And there's a short chase scene 
with this Camaro who just like hauls ass all over Miami. It's actually a pretty sweet chase scene. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I even enjoyed the little bit of 70s chase music mixed in between the piano. So the scene changes really fast. We jump to where the police have found that Camaro that led on that on that high speed chase. It's parked outside of like this apartment complex, I think is what it is. And Tubbs is there with the with the regular police. And there he's telling the police like, hey, we got to wait for backup. Backup comes pulling up with the sirens on because dumbass local board of police can't get their shit together. And mm-hmm. this is another really weird scene because then Tubbs just suddenly grabs a shotgun from the officer that's next to him. And he just starts running towards the building. And then he like runs alongside of it. Like there's no, does he actually see the guy or is he just running around with a shotgun? See, and that's what I put in my notes was that it's, Seems really weird. Here's Tubbs running down the street and then through uh, all these people with this shotgun. He's an undercover cop, so he's in plain clothes. Yeah. There's nothing identified right now. Yeah. And um, there's like, and, it, and no one make, cares. Yeah. To make it even worse, yeah. They're clearly not extras on that set. They're clearly told the normal people who are on the street, like, hey, we're going to film this scene, just act normal. And so no one responds uh-huh. to this guy just running out of this alleyway with a shotgun. In fact, you can see people in the back who are like smiling and pointing towards the camera as if like, like look, they're filming a TV show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And at no point did I see him chasing anybody. I didn't see anyone like running ahead of him. Yeah. So I don't know. He just like runs around and they determine that the guy is gone. There, there must be a part of that scene that got cut out that may, has that scene make way more sense. Yeah. Yeah. But that does lead us into my favorite scene of the episode when Tubbs, uh, Rod, Lieutenant Rodriguez, and half the police force show up to Crockett's house and ask his ex-wife if he can come out and play. <laughs> yeah. So before that, was that horrible. So so before that, right at the, the end of that scene where Tubbs is running around, Lieutenant Rodriguez and Tub or Lieutenant Rodriguez gets from another officer this book, and they they flip it open. They look at it they're like we got to find Crockett, and which kind of makes you think like, is this something of Crockett? Does he own it? You know, is that like like he's being set up? And then they run over to him. We go to Caroline's place, and Sonny and Caroline have hooked up. They were they were they were boning down right right before the police got there. And she straight no dirty. shame answers that door, knowing full <laughs> well how she looks. And he yeah. just waltzes out in his fucking like just in the pants, like you top button she was, undone. Yeah, like I'm a proud. You know, man. she was hoping Trudy was there too, just so she could rub it in. Hi, Trudy. Oh, Hold he's on. indisposed at the moment. Hold on. Hold on. You're reading Gina because I don't think this. I don't think that Crockett's dealt with with. Uh, oh God, what what were you calling Trudy up until this episode? <laughs> female tub. Oh, female tub. <laughs> female tub. <laughs> yeah. All right. So then, John. Speaking here's your he, John. Here's your time when the police come or Tubbs knocks on the door and asks if he can talk to Sonny. And like you're saying, it's like the. Tubbs and the police are asking Sonny to come out and play. Yeah, yeah, that is my favorite. This is my favorite scene. They go, they knock on the door. It's like, hi, hi, Caroline. Can Sonny come out and play? <laughs> uh, you, you know, it's just, it's hilarious, you know? I mean, especially like the body language of Tubbs standing at the door and like, and you see all the cops kind of nonchalantly walking around the background, <laughs> like looking away, whistling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so in the scene, Tubbs shows Crockett like, or and Lieutenant Rodriguez like they show Sonny. This is a hit list for from like an assassin, and you're on this list. There's only eight people on this list. You're on it. Crockett's like, whatever. I don't care. A lot of people want to kill me. It's like, well, there's only eight people on here, and six of them are already dead. And, and so they get to look. Yeah. Yeah. Like, oh. Now it's personal. <laughs> So we jump to the precinct, and Judy's telling Tubbs and Crockett that, you know, five of the people killed were all mid-level dealers, and they were looking to expand. Judy? Croc- Trudy. Okay, Trudy. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and we Forgive know that- them. They're not very involved in the show. So. No, they were They were. <laughs> it's hard to remember their in names. This episode. I want them to get all the credit that they deserve, because they were way more involved in this episode. Oh, yeah. Yeah, We've absolutely. been waiting for I'm them to become I'm starting to worry more that their spinoff is players. in jeopardy. <laughs> <laughs> We've been waiting for them to become more key players, and here you go. This is the first episode where they are they're in like I almost think, every I scene. Think at this point, I think the spinoff is going to the B team, uh Seth Rogan cop. Zwitek um, and Zito. So Yeah. So Trudy's telling him that five of the six people have been killed were middle level drug dealers. And that's kinda like what Crockett's um 
uh, his uh, his undercover persona is right. He's a mid level kind of expanding dealer. So that would kind of make sense that at this point, why they'd be targeting him. Carolina, they're telling him that Carolina and his mm-hmm. son have been moved to a safe house. And Crockett and Lieutenant Rodriguez is telling Crockett he has to go there too. He's he's not listening to Crockett protesting. Who you know he's doing a lot of it. And he's saying like, no, look, you got to go. You are not mm-hmm. p- taking part of this this investigation. So, but he worms yeah, his way he through. Them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But he still worms his way through, and he, him and Tubbs run out to go find number seven on the list, who is. Linus, I'm blanking out on his last name. It yeah, was I, Lionel. But... We jump from there, and oh. what L- Lieutenant Rodriguez makes Sonny go get his stuff and get ready for you know to go um, uh, to go to the safe house. He's got Lieutenant Rodriguez is going to force him. Tub says that you know he's going to take over to go look for, or the rest of the people are going to go look for number seven. So we have the scene where we jump back and forth from a tower to Crockett's. A uh, boat, tower, Cro- Cro- Crockett's boat, and it's this tower that at the top of it, you can see Crockett's boat, and the assassin is up there. We know, we kind of know it's him, but we learned a, cu- a couple things about him. One, he loves donuts. Okay, but yes, hold on, because that was I have my I, note too. I noted this because it's a damn crime. Okay, the man has half eaten that donut and not taken a single sip of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> well, not yet, but he's got like I, four <laughs> half-eaten donuts. Right. Like, I just want to understand how that's possible, because that's clearly the sign of a sociopath. <laughs> and and they're the donuts with the pink frosting and the sprinkles. I mean, I don't see any glaze. There's no jelly filled. <laughs> it's got some poor taste in donuts. I'm just saying. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, he's he's de- he he's like the Marlboro light smoker. He knows he's got a problem. He's trying to scale it back, but he's still smoking a pack a day. No, he's not even the Marlboro uh-huh. light. He's those camels with the with the menthol in the filter that you got to break. <laughs> he's that guy. <laughs> How do you know about those? <laughs> if mom and dad are listening, I don't know. I don't know what those are at all. In fact, we should probably edit this to be something different. <laughs> Too late. So we're jumping back and forth in this scene. It was like from the tower and to the boat where Crockett's packing up his stuff. And Lieutenant Rodriguez is there. And they're jumping back and forth. And back at the precinct, Trudy shows Tubbs. I mean... Like, what is, like, the worst – it's pre-fax machine, right? It was like someone sent them a file, and they printed it on their dot matrix printer of this really bad picture of, like, these criminals together that are associates of this guy, Mendez, who they're also – who they think they're looking for right now. And in that picture is Calderon, and they put together that Calderon is behind the assassinations. So (laughs) – And so we get the – we get the flashback of Tubbs in New Jersey seeing his cop buddies who he was impersonating at uh, originally. His brother. Uh, getting shot again. Right. Yeah, and so it's, once again, you know, now it's personal. Yep. Cooler yep. behind it. And Tubbs runs to the phone. He, he goes to call Sonny to warn him, like, hey, Calderon's behind this. I don't know why he needed to warn him right then. But that phone call makes Crockett, like, bend down. And for some reason, Rodriguez looks towards the tower and he sees a, a flash of, like, a gun, like, the sun glinting off of metal. And he's like, he, yeah, you know, he runs to save Crockett. And in the process, Lieutenant Rodriguez gets hit with that bullet. Which I got to say. That building that the that the assassin's on is pretty far away for him oh, to yeah. have seen such a strong glint off of the, the I'm assuming like the scope and, or and, something. And that's a pretty strong shot considering that's like a 1920s bolt action rifle he's using. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I mean that guy's money. He was money from far away. Like he was able to take care of business. Yeah. He wasn't the right guy, but he got someone. Yeah, yeah. He's dead, Jim. Yeah, Luke Cabrati <laughs> yeah. sleeps with the fishes now. <laughs> <laughs> so we jump to the hospital, and Lieutenant Rodriguez is in critical condition. He's barely hanging on. And Tubbs and Crockett are arguing that, that like Crockett does, he can't put anyone else in danger. He's just got to go into hiding, let the other detectives find this. But he, Tubbs realizes is that Crockett's not going to back down. So they're going to leave from there and go find number seven on the list. So they're out, they leave from the hospital, they're out driving, and Gina and Trudy have, they have a tail on not number seven already. So they're, they're radioing back and forth, like where he is, and eventually, of course, 
Trudy and Gina lose him and Tubbs and Crockett just happen to stumble upon n- n- number seven That's driving random. straight towards them. Of course. Yeah, of course. So they pull him over. Well, they don't really pull him uh-huh. over. It kind of goes on like on a little chase and then they stop at you know, parked at the front door. Some business. Well, I mean, how are you going to tail someone in a Ferrari? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, how is that not a noticeable, huh, this black Ferrari following me? <laughs> oh, yeah. In, in this, in every scene so far, whenever they pull someone over, it's like, how would these people ever know that these are police officers chasing them? Uh, yeah. And it's not so, just, any, it's so not just biz- any business that he pulls into. I think it's a car wash. Because <laughs> yeah. he makes uh, a joke about how he, oh, you know, he's just pulling in, get the car washed. <laughs> they find his coke and they find his money, and uh, he says he just wants, he he's just a friend. So <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> they do the whole little um, walk along the street, convince him to help them out, figure out who Men Mendov uh, M- Mendez is. Yeah. So they, they basically make him, they force him into a deal, right? Where it's like, you're not going to go down for these for this drugs and money as long as you work with us to ha- set us up with Mendez, who you we know you have a pending deal with. We jump from and there. And the whole time, Crockett keeps, oh, yeah. keeps looking up at buildings. Which yeah, yeah, Crockett's super nervous. A- right? After being shot at, yeah, he is super paranoid of tall buildings and Community relationships, but mostly tall buildings. <laughs> yeah, he keeps looking up at windows in the building, and he's like, then this guy comes running up behind him and grabs his shoulder, and Crockett pulls his gun out like he's going to, you know, because he's that nervous. The guy's done. He just dropped your smokes and hands it to him. And so then there's uh-huh. like the trailing camera of Tubbs and Crockett walking away. Then you turn, and there's the assassin sitting on the bench. Like, mm-hmm. damn, that guy's good. Yeah, and and that, I, that, at that point, I wanted him to kind of play up. Uh, uh, play with his mustache like a you know uh, dastardly you know. <laughs> we cut to the beach where now Sonny's gone to check in with you know they have a deal set up. They're going to go to Linus's club where he's got a deal to go down with Mendez. They don't know who Mendez is, so Linus has to be there. He doesn't want any part of this. He's trying to do as little work as possible. But he sets up his meeting that way. It's at his club. They're going to do the exchange. Trudy, Gina, Crockett, and Tubbs, and then a whole bunch of other police officers are going to be there to bring down Mendez. So they set all this deal up. We cut from there. We go to the beach, and it's at the safe house where Caroline and his son, Billy, are staying. And he's basically there just to tell them, like, hey, I'm going back to finish off this investigation. I'm not staying here with you. And it's like this sad moment between husband and wife. And then it's like this long time where he really touching moment where he's telling Billy that he's got to go and Billy's got to be the man of the house. And I thought for sure this was <laughs> foreshadowing that the assassin was going to miss Crockett and accidentally kill Billy. I thought for sure that's what was going to happen in this. <laughs> well, See, Billy the whole time I was just fun, so. and, uh, watching this, uh, the whole time I was thinking is, one, what the hell kind of pro- protective custody is this? <laughs> oh, walking along the beach. <laughs> um... <clears throat> and and like with Don Johnson with his shirt off walking with Caroline and the scene like I kept waiting for the scene to cut to Don Johnson and Caroline making pottery like in Ghost, <laughs> 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 you know. So, but uh, the the main thing I noticed is that up until this point we have had zero actual music yet. Yeah, we are more than a half hour into the episode and we haven't heard our first actual song. Mm, well, that was that was the scene. We finally hear something, and it's Crockett's theme that's play- from Jan Hammer that's playing in the background. That's which right. Is, which isn't really like a radio hit or something like that. It's just kind of a cult thing now because of the show, like Crockett's theme being its own song, which I, I don't know. I'll have to look it up to see if there is a Tubbs theme. Tubbs doesn't uh. get a theme. <laughs> <laughs> So we jump from the beach scene where he's saying goodbye, like he's thinking he's going to die, or I'm thinking Billy's going to die. And we jump to Linus's club. And the music, this is where we get real music. Pointer Sisters are playing. I'm so excited. And there's police all over the place. There's White Tech and Zito, the B team. I work in the bar. They're actually dressed up like bartenders. There's police all over the place. Tubbs is there with Gina. Linus is there, who they've, who they've framed to set up the, so that they can meet Mendez. 
and his date is Trudy. So they have this whole place covered. And in the conversation, they decide, the girls decide, Gina and Trudy, they're going to go dance and then kind of go work the crowd and go see if they can find anyone. And this is where we get to, like, another kind of awkward scene where she goes up and she starts talking to Switek. Trudy goes up, starts talking to Switek behind the bar. And they kind of make a couple jokes. And, like, normal club guy makes a pass at... You know, at Trudy and Gina slams his head onto the bar and Zwitek sprays a bunch of soda on his face. And then his partner, who's with him, acts like he didn't see none of that. Because as soon as that's over, he's like, hey, baby, how about how about me? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so and then, of course, like they push him away. So I take you know, the B team get too aggressive. They cause some problems and a brawl breaks out in the club. And the song changes for the brawl, right? Yeah, yeah. So the song changes. There's no reason for the song to change. It's like the Point of Sisters was playing in the club, but for the show, it switches to ZZ Tush by ZZ Pop for the for, which, for the brawl. Which is a yeah, which is a very interesting choice of ZZ Top song. I mean, um I wouldn't think I mean I get ZZ Top rock and roll like like would fit you know, especially being an inordinate amount of white people um poorly dancing in the club <laughs> um so i mean I, I guess you know rock and roll zz top for the fight scene but i just don't get tush like yeah. of all of their whole collection like it like tush didn't seem like yeah i think like lagrange or something uh, maybe like something like pearl necklace <laughs> <laughs> what yes. kind of club do you think i don't know going all to? zz top songs are about sex <laughs> All ZZ Top songs are about sex. They're not about fighting. That's the that's the trouble I'm having. There's no there's a disconnect there. Well, mm. I mean, in fairness, they started fighting because Club Bro and his BFF were looking were looking at Trudy. At mm-hmm. so, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anyway, so we'll the so that. the brawl so the brawl breaks out, and I couldn't help but notice how absolutely nobody else in the club could give any crap about what's happening around them they keep zooming into all of these faces of people and none of them look amused or distracted at all they all look bored yeah i i thought they were all supposed (laughs) to be cops like there was that many cops in there but then a bunch of regular but i don't think they are because then a then regular clothes like dressed police officers come running in like 30 of them come running in Right, and they break up this brawl, and I don't know how they figure out which one's Mendez because they have him tackled on the ground, and then they bring Linus out, and he says like, "Yep, that's the guy, that's Mendez right there." So it was like almost like they knew what what he looked like. They just needed con- con- confirmation, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know because in one of the next scenes, don't they? Doesn't it turn out to be the wrong guy? Isn't that not Mendez? <clears throat> it is Mendez, but he's just like an associate, right? Like that guy that okay. drove, because it's the same yeah. guy that was driving the Camaro in the chase scene. Mm. It's the same guy. Gotcha. So we leave from there. They 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 feel like they got their guy. Like everyone's relieved. Like oh, we got him. Crockett tells Tubbs he thanks him for putting his life on the line to save him, and Crockett's gonna go back to Caroline. They're happy. They got their guy. Uh, but as we're leaving, we see the assassin is in the crowd and he looks like disappointed, but he just leaves. So we cut mm-hmm. from there, we go back to the precinct and Tubbs is interrogating Mendez, which like, I guess Tubbs is like the best interrogator, right? Because he's the guy that does all of the interrogating. Right. So he's, he's doing his normal bad cop stuff. Yeah. So he, he's in the middle of his interrogation. He gets called out. And he had goes because he's got a phone call. And the phone call was homicide. And they're saying that they just found Linus. He'd been killed. And so that means that Mendez is not the assassin. It's some other guy. So Tubbs breaks back in there. He's pissed. He grabs him, holds him in the corner. He's like, tell me who it is. And Mendez's like, I ain't telling you shit. And then Gina comes running in to pull the, the rain Tubbs in. And they realize right then, it's like, oh, shit. That means that Sonny is the last person on this list. And this is where it went from, like, for me, it was like, oh, ho-hum. Kind of episode, like, oh, snap, son. Like, right? <laughs> yeah. Shit just got real. Uh-huh. It's yeah. just been Yeah, real so, food. I mean. Here we are, thirty-eight minutes into the episode, and I and I finally have something to get excited about. Yeah, I mean, it was a slow build, but it's it's it was it, in my eyes, it was kind of worth it because we get there, I was like, oh shit, like he's there with Caroline and Billy, like this could go horribly wrong because this assassin is like top notch, grade A, like he gets his shit done. Now we have this like 
cool montage, right? Where they're jumping back and forth between like Caroline and Cro- and Crockett driving their their um their hatchback or their uh, station wagon, like big old cheesy smiles, like living the dream family life, right? Pulling up to their uh-huh. uh to their safe house. Meanwhile, Tubbs and Gina are hauling ass through Miami to get out to wherever the safe house is. So I just want to point out right now, while I was doing research on this episode, I discovered it. This is the scene. So Tubbs is hauling ass and he happens to be driving Crockett's uh, Daytona Ferrari. Yep. Okay. Um, this is the only episode in which Tubbs uh, drives any of Crockett's Ferraris mm. for the entire length of the show. Wait, wow. Ferraris? How, wait, how many Ferraris does he have? I thought it was just the one. Oh, Apparently, no. Apparently, we get introduced in later seasons to different Ferraris. Yeah, what? yeah. In later seasons, I've seen some clips of it. He drives like the badass, low to the ground, big, you know, uh, spoiler on the back with the doors open straight up and down, like the stereotypical Ferrari. Like he drives those later. Oh. Yeah. Damn, I guess it pays to not be killed for that many seasons. I don't well, know. I guess it also raises the question is like, you know, when he's doing these deals and stuff, is he reporting all of the money that he's getting? <laughs> right. Is he yeah, really exactly. dealing on That's, the side here? Again, again, I ask myself, how does he have this much money? How can he afford these things? Yeah. He's yeah. got multiple boats. He's got a Ferrari. Yeah. So we're cutting back and forth, you know. Car driving fast, breaking through red lights, which is like actually B-roll we've seen in other episodes so far. There's like when he runs through that red light, we've seen that. That was in the last episode, too. They didn't. That was in runnings. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So they jump back and forth. Sonny driving like his Uncle Buck family car back up to the house, you know, and Tubbs and Gene are hauling ass to get there. And when... Net, net, now we're to the final scene. Sonny opens up the door and in comes the family and everything is great. And Sonny turns and sees a half-eaten donut and coffee spilled on the carpet. Now, up to this point, the assassin has been, like, the best assassin ever. (laughs) So that's my one note, is all of a sudden he's now the worst shot in the world? (laughs) I I have have a problem a little bit, too. They've been under protective custody. Coffee and donuts being, like, present there at the safe house... I mean, they've been surrounded by cops. Of course, there's going to be multiple empty cups of coffee and half-eaten donuts around. <laughs> like this should not, this should not be suspicious. But they weren't under protective custody at that house. Well, they weren't anymore because they thought oh. they had gotten their guy. Yes, but that's where they had been protecting them before. Oh. Well, you're right. Ma- you're <laughs> no, right. they took them to the safe house. Like they, they didn't stay at their house. That's true. That wasn't the safe house anymore. That was Caroline's house. That was right. Ca- Caroline and Sonny's house. That was their regular house. Right. Uh, oh. Yeah, they're coming back to mm. like their actual family home. And they had mm-hmm. taken them out when they moved her to protective custody. So there shouldn't have been anything there. Yeah, that's true. That's, that's true. true. But so someone they, needs to yeah. seriously speak to this guy about his coffee donut addiction. <laughs> I mean, finish <laughs> one of them at least. <laughs> right, right. Stop getting coffee if you're not going to drink that <laughs> shit, okay? God. So <clears throat> this goes to, this seems to be a theme so far in the beginning of this show. So we get into the firefight, and the result of the firefight seems to continually happen. I'm going to let you finish summarizing it before, you know, rather than just yeah, yeah. blurt it out. So Sonny looks up, he sees that like a shelf had been moved, and so he throws Caroline and Billy to the ground, he covers them, and the assassin just instead of like his normal like controlled self great shot like in that scene where he shoots Rodriguez with the sniper rifle, he just opens up you know, it with, with on my weapon, just spraying the wall and like the door and everything. And he gets in a shootout with Sonny. And then a couple of seconds later, Tubbs pulls up, who's just like a few seconds late. He kicks, he comes in the door and then Tubbs and Sonny are having a shootout with the assassin. And the assassin ends up shooting the window out and tries to jump outside and run. And waiting out there was like nine police cars who couldn't get there like 30 seconds sooner. And they shoot and kill mm-hmm. the assassin. Full of the most unimpressed cops that you've ever seen like all of them are just sitting out there even gina in her in her dress like her whole getup is just Mm -hmm. sitting there looking at him like as though it doesn't it's not registered at all that she's actually firing on anybody 
Yeah. She looks like she could fall so, asleep in this, any minute. And this is what I was going to say has become the trend. They don't ever end up, they always kill whoever they're after. And so far in mm-hmm. every, almost every episode, except Calderon escaping, every bad person they've gone after, they've completely wasted them at the end of the episode. Yeah, which never I mean, makes it I where guess... it's like they can never do further investigations. Like, who is this guy associated with? Like, we'll never know because we just, we're, we just execute everyone we run into. Exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, um, I mean, I guess it makes it cleaner, you know, no trial or anything. But, <laughs> I mean, at some point they need to arrest someone. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I thought for sure, like, this is this is it. Like, Billy got hit. Caroline's laying on top of Billy. Billy's been hit, and this is the tweak in the season or in the show where we. this is the tragedy that happens that haunts Sonny throughout the rest of the show. But it's not. They're totally fine. Everyone's safe. The assassin's been killed. And we get to the next morning and just end the episode. Caroline's waiting in her car, and she tells Sonny, like, they, they just have, like, a. you can tell they're going to have a mutual understanding. Like, Caroline cannot function with Sonny's job. And now the, they're not... They're not going to make it work anymore. Caroline's going to going to finish up the the divorce. So, after so she- ultimately, we we've come full circle back around to the same spot we were in their relationship before. They're yes. getting divorced, and Sonny's going to live on the boat with an alligator and become a a folk hero or something. Yeah. So we've gone full circle on everything, right? The assassin's been killed, mm-hmm. so there's no more a hit on Sonny. Caroline, he's still getting divorced. He's still an undercover cop, and Calderon is still missing somewhere. So, like, it's, it's, it's mm. like this episode never happened. The only, per, the only, there's only two people that really affected. There are two other people, the the other two dealers that got killed in this episode. But who cares about them? Well, the <laughs> only other person that got affected in this episode was that this was the final episode for Gregory Sierra, aka Lieutenant Rodriguez. Yep, who apparently the last scene they find the last thing that happens is they find out that Lieutenant Rodriguez had died from that gunshot. And, and so apparently he had requested at that time to be written off the show because he didn't like living in lost in Miami. So, um, which I don't blame him. I agree with him. I wouldn't like to live in Miami either. But um <laughs> do you uh, think- I do think it's weird. I can't imagine I had I can't picture any other show, a uh, popular show nowadays where um people wouldn't fans would just explode if someone said like you know if Gibbs Gibbs from NCIS decided he didn't like filming in Washington DC anymore so he wanted to be off the show people would lose their minds yeah cuz Lieutenant Rodriguez is a big part of this of the show so far yeah i mean he was he's basically been one of the staple characters it's been you know i mean crockett tubs and then like the next most frequent characters their lieutenant that we see Mm -hmm. so i just it's very strange to me but it is also very exciting because that means the person who comes to take over for him um happens to be one of my favorite all-time actors so (laughs) yeah edward james almost is going to become the new lieutenant spoiler alert if you because about shows mm-hmm. from thirty years ago, uh, <laughs> and um, and he he will always be Commander or Admiral Adama to me. <laughs> now, the last Battle thing Star reference said, for all of you people yeah. out there. <laughs> the the episode ends with the last line is that they say Calderon is in the Bahamas, and Sonny says like, "How fast can you get re- ready, Tubbs?" And they're gonna sounds like they're gonna head out to the Bahamas, and this is definitely a two part episode. And that pretty much sums up everything that mm-hmm. happened in this episode. Let's go and check in on the music for this episode. Music in this episode is a short list, uh, an interesting list too. So we had the Pointer Sisters. I'm so excited, which is in the scene where they go to Linus's club. And John, you were saying before that this uh, that song they had just re released that song a month before this episode aired. Yeah. So the Pointer Sisters released uh, "I'm So Excited" in 1982, but it was a uh, and it did so well. That when they released their next album, which was more of their feature album, um, in 84, they re-released this song. And it actually posted, uh, I want to say, number nine on the Billboard charts. Mm. And so it was just, it just happened to be like 
a very popular song mm-hmm. right uh, that had just been re-released right at the same time as this episode. So the next song is ZZ Top's Tush, which is in the same scene, which is, you know, a classic ZZ Top song. And then the last song, which we did um, mention in the time that when we were going through the episode, John, you got something to say about ZZ? No, just, the, you know, uh, once again, I, I love ZZ Top, but all their songs are about sex, and I just don't get how it fit for that <laughs> fight scene, but... Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure there's someone out there that could explain some reason why they would try to use that song. So the last song was, which we didn't mention when we're going through the roundup on the show, is in that scene where Gina and Trudy are racing out to save Crockett and Crockett's pulling back up to his house. The song is playing as Russ Ballard's In the Night which I couldn't find any information about when I looked it up, but it sounds like, Johnny, you're, you're, you're able to find a little something about it. I found a little something. And so basically, once again, this song was released in 84 as well, in the summer of 84 as well. And so it seems to me, he seen, uh, from what I learned, he wasn't, he had a small following, but wasn't a uh, major artist, more of just like an indie artist at the time. It seems to me they, they took his, they just took two songs, were really popular at the time and stunk them into the episode Mm -hmm. Russ Ballard I guess would be the equivalent of like an indie artist song that was popular at the time that they used and they actually used two of his songs in episodes in the first season so Mm. I guess that would kind of be the obscure artist that was popular at the time yeah well, I mean, that's pretty much all the music that was in this episode. We did get a, a, an introduction to Jan Hammer's Crockett's theme, uh, which obviously, I mean, we're all here. There's two, there's two things that we're here for we're watching Miami Me Vice. We're here for Crockett, and, and we're Crockett here and for Jan Gina. Hammer. Yeah, and we're here <laughs> for Jan Hammer. So that's going to conclude the music. Let's go and go to our final thoughts on this episode. So let's sum this thing up here. We had, you know, in my opinion, it was a, pr- a pretty great episode. Jenna, how about you kick us off with this roundup? What was your final thoughts on this episode? Uh, yeah, I mean, well, so significant improvement from Cool Runnings. Uh, I thought it, we were getting right back into things. It, they weren't trying so hard to to have like the comedy and make it more. I, I'm assuming that they were going for like a more well-rounded to the, to the demographic that may be watching it. Uh, they, they went back to the formula that worked for them and that's awesome. But the one thing that I'm just, I'm still super concerned about is just how many people are dying. <laughs> um, especially off of the police force. Like I just, I'm, I'm curious as to whether or not that means that they're, are constantly going to be introducing new characters because they keep killing these characters off or if the like that's going to start becoming less of a of an issue right but so far even characters that are i what you would assume is like fairly mainstay at this point i.e rodriguez and then there they go like they're just they're written off or whatever um Mm -hmm. So I, it feels a little, oh, I guess almost maybe like Game of Thrones esque, like no one's safe. I don't yeah. know who I don't know who to invest in. So. Yeah, that's true. That's true. John, what are your final thoughts on this, the fifth episode of the first season of Miami Vice? So my final thoughts are the only part uh, the this episode. Uh, it wasn't until the firefight that I really got excited about it, and one of the things that. I kind of take an interest in is is the firefights that they have in this show and what and while doing research I I read something that they were actually the producers and director were really focused on everyone ha- being extremely proficient with firearms and so like the assassin in this episode it was actually a uh, professional shooter. I, I forget what they call for, you know, like they do it for sport. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, um, mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure. But he was like one. a profession. Yeah, but he was like a professional with weapons and something. And they talked, and, and in this article I'm reading, they're talking about how, you know, everything they do in these certain techniques, like he shows off these certain techniques in the episode and in the way he shoots people and stuff like that. But at the very end of the article, they mentioned that during this episode, they had slight technical difficulties during the firefight, in which at one point, the silencer on one of the rifles flew off, 
and, and actually flew toward the cameraman. <laughs> and then a a squim actually went off too early, which is the when the fit the explosion that makes it look like you got shot. That's oh, a yeah, squim. Yeah. Uh, it actually went off too early, and, and it because Don Johnson hadn't backed away yet. It actually went off in his face, <laughs> and so I just thought it was hilarious how they, how they praised them for their handling of weapons throughout this entire article I read. And then at the very end, they're like, oh, yeah, uh, the, Don Johnson almost got his face blown off and the cameraman <laughs> almost got pelted with a, uh, with a silencer. But uh, I, I am impressed by the firefights. They have been very unique and very exciting. So I, I kind of can't wait to see how, uh, how they can continue to top each other. You know? mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, the closest thing off, you know, as it seems to be that every, each week so far, I've been the one that, you know, the last few weeks or two weeks, I've been the one to defend the episode at the end, you know. And I have to say, what gets me, it, this felt com- comfortable. We're back to where I wanted to be with Miami Vice. You know, it was a it was a good story. It kept me engaged throughout it, but it's like the perfect show for me. And I don't know how you watched it in the 80s, but it's perfect for me now where I can be reading Twitter or Instagram on my phone and just check in every couple of minutes and I know what's going on and then just pay attention to the last 10 minutes because something really good is going to happen. That just hits a sweet spot for me when it comes to a TV show that I can half pay attention until the last 10 minutes of the show. Absolutely. You know, I I enjoyed this episode. The buildup was nice. I'm happy this is a two-part episode. So that means that we can get to, you know, we can get back now to like Sonny's out to get revenge. God damn it. Someone's going to die. I'm happy that we're back to that point and we're away from the goofiness that was cool running. But, uh, you know, a little goofiness every once in a while doesn't hurt anyone. Agreed. Yeah. And I still, uh, I can't wait for uh, Noogie come back. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm so ready. <laughs> According to our in-house Miami Vice expert my wife who we will get on an episode soon we will make sure that she's on one soon so she can have a little bit more detail about someone who's a super fan she assures me that noogie is a routine actor and, and makes routine appearances in episodes for the remainder of the show that's amazing i cannot wait <laughs> so that's gonna sum it up this week and i can't for... wait for <laughs> go ahead john and i cannot wait for for Melissa to join us so we can make her cry <laughs> <laughs> with our pitiful, pitiful opinions. Yeah. Look, you guys don't get it at all. <laughs> uh, that's gonna that's do it it. For this I'm going, week. where's my box set? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So that's going to do it this week for Go With The Heat. You know, this is the enthusiast guide for the phenomenon that is Miami Vice. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Be sure to subscribe. We have a website now, and soon you will be able to go and subscribe to our RSS feed on that website. The website we will name next week because we are still in the process of building it. But trust me, RSS feeds are coming soon. We will be This episode will become available. You'll be able to get all the back episodes. The website will be up and running. And we are so, so close to being a legit, true podcast. I hope you are happy with the show, how it's been going so far. Trust us, we're doing what we can each week to make it better. And be sure to subscribe. And this week, we'll actually start to announce how you can get a hold of us, too. My name is Dominic. You can get me on Twitter, at Dom Corvo. Jenna, where, where can people get a hold of you? I am at Jenna A. Barham on Twitter. It's Barham. And John, how can people get a hold of you if they got any questions about your shenanigans? I am Spaceman at Corvo John. <laughs> so that's on Twitter. You can get all of us on Twitter if you want to reach out to us and have any comments or questions. And we'll see you all next week. Bye, pals. Bye, everybody. <laughs>